If you'll turn back to Hebrews chapter 10 with me, I just want to make another couple of comments before we go on. Hebrews chapter 10. Last time we were in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1 to 14. And this is what it says. I just want to read it again. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1 says, For the law, remember this is contrasting what the law can do for you and what the body of Jesus Christ was able to do that the law never could. For the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of the things, can never, by the same sacrifices which they offer continually, year after year, the law can never make perfect those who draw near. The idea here is the law, with all of its animal sacrifices, could never completely remove the guilt of sin. That's not what the law was intended to do. It wasn't to remove, to take away the guilt that every man has because of their sin. So the law and its animal sacrifices could not completely perfect, could not complete us, those who drew near to it. Otherwise, they would have ceased, would they not have ceased to be offered? Why would you continue offering sacrifices if they were able to remove a guilt, the guilt of a man forever? Why would you have to do it the next day? Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? Because the worshipers, those who were bringing the sacrifices, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had consciousness of sin. They would have been freed from their guilt but in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. And it says here in verse 4, For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. The Old Testament Jewish animal sacrifices, like I told you last time, from verse 1, the shadow of the good things to come, but not the very form of the things. They were just a shadow. And I said something to the effect that the Old Testament animal sacrifices were like a black and white sketch of the fully completed, fully colored, fully painted death of Jesus Christ that would come in the future. So it was a, it was a sketch at best. It was, a, it was a, like an artist outline in black and white of, of images that he wanted to paint on the canvas so you could see what the image would be eventually, but it wasn't, it wasn't fully completed until the death of Jesus Christ came and added color to the picture, completed it, Jesus the Lamb of God. Verse 5 says, Therefore, when He, Jesus, the Savior, Messiah, when He comes into the world, He says, and we followed this conversation of God the Son and God the Father, the Son says, Sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for Me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have taken no pleasure. And then Jesus, it says, Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God, O God the Father, we would say. After saying above this idea of sacrificing and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you've not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them, these things which are offered, these offerings offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, Jesus again, be said, Behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first, He takes away the law by completing it, but all the, the, the sacrifices, the animal sacrifices of the law, are taken away forever when Jesus died once and for all. Not the animal sacrifice, but the human, the Lamb of God, the Jesus Christ body sacrifice on the cross. It says, I have come to do your will, and He takes away the first in order to establish the second. And this is where I want to camp for just a minute. It says, By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now just read that slowly again. Jesus says, I have come to do your will. I have come to fulfill, to pay the penalty that you have against man's sins, Father. I have come to pay the penalty. I have come to do your will through this body that you've given me, I've come to do your will. And in verse 10 says, By this will, we have been set apart, sanctified, made holy through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. How is it that a man becomes sanctified, holy, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ, 
That offering happened one time and for all time and for all men. Now, I say that again tonight because when you understand that the offering of the body of Jesus Christ was necessary to save us, the offering of the human body of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, the offering of the body of Jesus Christ is necessary to save us, then anything you might add to the gospel, to the offering of the body of Jesus Christ, becomes more and more ridiculous the more you understand what it took to save men's souls, the more any human addition to the offering of the body of Jesus Christ according to the will of the Father to save humanity, it just becomes almost ludicrous to say, oh, but you have to confess your sins, oh man. Oh, but you have to be baptized also. It, it just it becomes so... so childlike in its foolishness to think that the offering of the body of Jesus Christ based on the will of the Father that whatever I could whatever little simplistic thing I could add to it that's what really turns the tide that's what God's really waiting for it just becomes more and more unrealistic that man could add anything to this plan of God, this will of the Father to sacrifice His own Son on the cross, that the body of Jesus Christ bore our sins in His own body, to think there's anything that a man can offer simply becomes more and more ridiculous. So I ask a couple of questions. How can confessing my sins, now I'm talking about for salvation, how can believing in Jesus Christ, the offering of the body of Jesus Christ, how could confessing my sins as an addition to that, how could it even possibly compare to the work that Christ did for me, the offering of the body of Jesus Christ? How can keeping the Mosaic law to be saved, how can keeping the Mosaic law compare to the offering of the body of Jesus Christ based on the will of the Father? You see? You see how the more you know, the more you read in the book, the, the sillier it gets almost. That you could, that you have to, the humans have to add something to salvation, to the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. That you offer your little pittance. And God says, oh, that's exactly what I was waiting for. The offering of the body of Jesus Christ was just clearly not enough. It's insanity. How can doing good works, imagine what your good works are. Whatever the best thing you can think up to offer God, imagine what, what and in, in what way could that possibly compare to the offering of the body of Jesus Christ according to the will of the Father. In what way could that compare? But God, don't forget, I... No, God would say, no unbeliever, don't forget my son and the offering of the body of Jesus Christ on the cross. You come to me as unbelief because every knee will bow before the son. Every knee will confess that Jesus is Lord. Imagine trying to get into heaven based on some amount of something that you conjured up that God has to let me in because I've done the work. And he says, you forget you never would believe the offering of the body of Jesus Christ is what it took to save souls. The blood of bulls and goats, you could probably say that in the millions, animals were offered on, on the, the Jewish tabernacle altar and on the Jewish temple altar. You go into the Bible when they dedicated the temple for the first time when Solomon had the temple finished and they dedicated the temple. We're talking about in the hundreds of thousands of animals offered on that day. So over the 1,500 years of Jewish tabernacle and temple living, you could easily say that the number of animals offered to cover sin was in the millions. And all of that animal sacrifice didn't pay for one sin. All it did was cover it. And what God the Father determined is that the body of the Son of God, 
the, the eternal Son of God would take on a human body and that human body is what was necessary for all the sins of the world to be poured out onto. And in that sacrifice on the cross, the Father was satisfied. And it makes it more and more ridiculous when you consider what God demanded of the Son that you could add any little thing to salvation like doing good works that could compare with what God demanded, what the will of God was to sacrifice the body, the humanity of Jesus Christ on the cross. How can being baptized... What, what is that? That being baptized, what is this hold of the church of Christ that, that me taking a human being and dunking him underwater and picking him up again, now that's what's going to save you. How in the world does that compare with the offering of the body of Jesus Christ? How can that be what God's waiting for, that one little thing you have to also do in order to be saved? It just becomes silly and inconsequential. Silly is the word. Silly and inconsequential, everything man could possibly add becomes silly and inconsequential when you fully come to understand that without God the Son being given a human body by God the Father, a body you have given me, without God the Son being given a human body by God the Father, there would be no salvation of any human soul. And I don't know why church after church after church preaches something other than Jesus paid it all. If you understand what it took to be saved, if you understand the penalty and what God the Father demanded of the Son, then adding anything to that is disgraceful. It's just so disgraceful of the work that Jesus did for us. Salvation of humanity is so far beyond the little things that man can do like confessing sins and keeping the law and doing good deeds and being baptized. What it takes to save a man's soul is infinitely far beyond anything that we could conjure up and offer to God the Father. It took the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That was the penalty. That was the only thing that could lift the penalty. So as we're going through all these distortions, perversions of the gospel, I take you to, to places like Hebrews chapter 10 so you can hold on to the fact. Hold on firmly because Satan wants to pick you off. Satan would love for one of you to leave this church. Not this church, not Gulf Coast Bible Church, but the church universal. He would love like he did a friend of mine, a dear friend of mine, he would love for you to be a, a casualty of Christianity, of the Galatians, the Judaizers fight against the Christian. I've got a good friend, a dear, dear friend, stood beside me as I said, I do to Amy, who went to Dallas Theological Seminary. Maybe he'll hear this one day and maybe he'll know how much I love him and how much what he did was a distortion of the truth of Jesus Christ. He went to Dallas Theological Seminary because he was determined to become a pastor. And when he was at Dallas Seminary, he had to take a, a history class. And in that history class, the notion was floated somehow. I don't know if he made it up or if the professor actually said it, but he said you can't interpret the Bible alone. You have to interpret the Bible and the traditions of the church. So you have to go back to the church fathers, to Augustine, to Origen, to the earliest church fathers and see how they interpreted the Bible. See what traditions they began in the church. So my friend left the faith he no longer believes that, you, that to be saved, you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you're saved. 
He's now in the Greek Orthodox Church, and he believes that in order to be saved, you have to bring your pile of good deeds. You have to say all the proper prayers on the proper mornings. One shade away, it's the Protestant it's the Protestant equivalent to Catholicism. With all the idols in the church, I mean, you've never seen idols until you see a Greek Orthodox church. Loaded. And Satan would love to pick off, just pick us off one at a time. So he took a pastor from being a pastor preaching free grace and salvation uh, through belief in Jesus Christ, and he took him off into the Greek Orthodox Church, never to preach the gospel again. And he would love to do that to you. I had countless kids that some, thank the Lord, have come back to the faith. But there were many kids in the, in the youth program over the last 10 years that have wandered out, and not just kids that didn't have parents teaching them the Bible, but kids that were pastor's kids. So nobody is immune. I told you a couple of weeks ago about a pastor friend that I had who taught the Bible just like I teach the Bible, just like a hundred other men in the country teach the Bible, or a thousand or whatever the number is, who now denounces everything that I would say to you today. Nobody's immune to falling. Salvation of souls is so far beyond the little things that a man can do to offer to God that we have to understand the depths of what it took for human souls to be saved. I mean, imagine the penalty. The penalty to Adam was, you will die separated from me forever in a lake of fire. How do you take an eternal penalty of a man's soul burning in a lake of fire for eternity? How do you take that times 20 million or however many men have lived, 20 billion, let's say, and reduce that to three hours on a cross? Because somehow the Father did that. Our eternal punishment was taken care of on the cross in a three-hour period when our sins were poured out on the Son. And you think being baptized in somehow adds to that? You see how silly it is when you understand just what Jesus did, just what the Father paid that day in giving His Son to us and sacrificing Him in our place? All, this, all these additions invite Jesus into your heart. Make Jesus Lord of your life. Oh my goodness, so silly. It's such, just so diminishing of what Jesus accomplished to think that doing that is what God's waiting for. That's what He wants to hear. That's what's going to get you saved. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. The father had a righteous demand, and the demand was that all must die, spiritually die, be separated from, from me for all eternity. The, right, the father had a righteous demand. It was a pure demand. It was right. It was just. It was fair that all must die, and God the Son agreed to die in our place. He agreed to meet the righteous demand of the father. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours, Father, be done. And he went to the cross for us. After which he said again to Telestai, it is finished. How can anybody think you can add to that? How are the churches bewitching people to think that you can, that to be saved you have to believe? Yes, Jesus did a lot, but he didn't do it all. You have to do this. And the package of you and Jesus is what gets you saved. Jesus dying on the cross and your confession of sins, that's the package. Jesus dying on the cross and your baptism, now that's the package that the Father's looking for. And I go to Hebrews chapter 10 and read it slowly and read it in this language or the Greek language and think how unrealistic and simple and degrading to the work that Jesus did for me on the cross. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11, it says, Every priest stands daily. Old Testament. Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But He, Jesus, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, He sat down. He's no longer standing. His work is finished. 
He sat down at the right hand of God waiting from that time onward until His his own, Jesus' own enemies be made a footstool for His feet, including Satan and the demons and all unbelievers. A footstool for His feet. Verse 14 says, For by one offering, one time, for by one offering, the offering of the cross, Golgotha 2,000 years ago, for by one offering He has perfected for all time those who are set apart, who are sanctified, who are made holy. So this is what it means. Jesus is offering. Jesus offering His body has completely separated each one of us from our sin guilt forever. We're righteous. We're not guilty. The moment we believe in Jesus Christ, the Father declared us righteous and eternally so. The guilt of sin, of Adam's sin, was taken off. We're no longer a son of Adam. We're a son of the Father. We're children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. We're no longer sons of Adam. We're sons of the Father now. His offering, Jesus' offering, has completed what we could never have done for ourselves. It has freed us once and for all from the guilt of our sin. I just want to look at some of the things here that Jesus' death in our place accomplished. When you understand what the death was, when you understand the, the, the lengths that the Father and the Son had to go to in order to save you personally, you, this is personal. The lengths that the Father went to to send the Son to earth is personal to you. When you understand the lengths that He went to and you see what we got, what, what was available to us, effective to us, through the cross of Jesus Christ, through His death, the things that His cross accomplished, adding something to it, it just gets more and more ridiculous. A few things. Number one, we can no longer be condemned. Come on now. We can no longer be condemned as sinners since we're shielded by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. No more guilt. Guilt is removed. No more guilt. We can never be condemned by Satan. Satan would love to be able to condemn us to to an eternity in the lake of fire. It can't be done. Paul says later in Romans 8, I'm persuaded that neither death nor life, powers, principalities, all those things, that one of those, those principalities, these are the demons, the angels, the demons. Nobody can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Romans 8 chapter 1 says this, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus, Paul's way of saying that believer, that person who's believed in Jesus Christ as their Savior, who's placed by God the Holy Spirit in union with Jesus Christ, placed in the body of Christ, made a part of the body of uh, the bride of Christ, that person, once he's believed in Jesus Christ, can never be condemned. And you think, but you have to confess your sins and believe in Christ to be baptized. To be saved. I have to be dunked underwater in order for God the Father to, to save me from condemnation. It's just silly. It's, it's almost silly talk. Happens in every church of Christ in the world. Yes, Jesus did a lot, but until you feel that water, not, not savable. So we can no longer be condemned. What else did that death of Jesus Christ do for you? It justified us. What is being baptized or doing good? How how in the world, where in the Bible does it say doing good deeds, keeping the Mosaic law, being baptized, confessing your sins, inviting Jesus into your heart, making Jesus Lord of your life? Where does the Bible say that justifies an unbeliever? It doesn't anywhere. We're justified. We're declared righteous. 2 Corinthians 5.21. Look what the verse says. 
He made Him. We're talking about the Father and the Son. This was a, this was a plan of the Father and the Son made possible through God the Holy Spirit. But the Father made the Son who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him, the greatest transfer in all of human history. Jesus Christ takes our sin. We take Jesus' righteousness when we believe in Him as Savior. Astounding transfer. So we're justified at the moment we believe. This is what Jesus' cross made possible. This is what His death, burial, and resurrection made possible for me and you. You can't add to that. The Father made Jesus who knew no sin to be sin on your behalf. Put your name on there. Put your name in the verse on Rick's behalf so that Rick might become the righteousness of God in Jesus. An astounding phrase. True. Perfectly true. What else did the death of Jesus Christ do for you and me? It allowed us to be forgiven of our sins. Where does the Bible say you're a sinner and the only way to be forgiven of sins is to confess as an unbeliever, to believe in Jesus and confess, to believe in Jesus and walk an aisle, to believe in Jesus and join a church, to believe in Jesus and do good works, to believe in Jesus plus anything. It never says that. The Bible says that our sins are forgiven in this way. Look what it says in Acts chapter 10, verse 43. Of Him, Jesus... All the prophets bear witness that through His name, everyone who believes in Him receives forgiveness of sins. I challenge you, if you don't believe it, go into the Bible. I know you all believe it. But go into the Bible and, and look up somewhere where you are forgiven of a sin in any other way. Now, I mean eternally to go from being an unbeliever to a believer. Remember, everything I'm talking about has to do with sal salvation being saved. Of course we confess sins and we're forgiven of our sins, but we're going back into the moment when you were an unbeliever and you became a believer. And the only way that your sins were forgiven was not by anything that you did except for believe that Jesus did it all. Through His name, everyone who believes in Him receives forgiveness of sins. How can you add to that? It's so simple in the Bible when you start piecing all these facts about salvation together, you realize nothing I could do could ever forgive my sins. Nothing I could do could ever get the Father to declare me righteous. Nothing I could do could lift the condemnation that is on me. But the cross of Jesus Christ did it. We stand in God's grace. We stand in God's grace. You say, Rick, what does that mean? Let's look at it. In Romans chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, this is what the Bible says. Therefore, having been justified by faith, declared righteous at the moment we believed, that's what justified by faith means, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. What did you, in the first part of that verse, what did Jesus Christ make possible? Our relationship with God the Father was not peaceful. When we, were, when we were separated from God, when we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We were at enmity with God. We were not His children. But through Jesus Christ and faith in Jesus' work, we now have peace with God. I'll take it. In what way could an unbeliever make himself at peace with God? The Bible never says anything about doing anything other than faith in Jesus Christ producing peace with God. There's no other way to gain that relationship. Faith, it does, that doesn't add anything to faith here. Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also, oh, there's more. It's not just peace with God, there's more. Through Jesus Christ and faith in Jesus Christ also, we have obtained our introduction by faith again, into this grace in which we stand and we and we exult and we exult in the hope of the glory of God that verse there i don't know what your bible says i know it's different we have obtained our introduction what does that mean 
It says that Jesus, Jesus put us, when we believed in Jesus as our Savior, our relationship with the Father drastically changed and forever changed. And now we are at peace with the Father. It also says, through whom also we have obtained our introduction. Now that obtained our introduction translates this Greek word, prosagoge. Obtained our introduction. What does it mean? What did Jesus do for us before the Father? This word prosagoge means to, to have access or to have an opportunity of admittance. Imagine the throne room of God being off limits to the unbeliever because it is. But what did Jesus Christ give us? An opportunity to be admitted there into the presence of, of His Father. It also means a privilege of approach to a person of high rank. I think of, of uh, if we were in a courtroom and I was the judge, and this is the, my, my station, my whatever the judge calls it. Rem huh? When, a, when, a, when an attorney wants to approach the judge, can the attorney just say, I got something to say to you in private, and walk up there? Does an attorney have the privilege of approach to the high-ranking judge? No, he doesn't. What does the attorney have to say? Has to ask a question. May I approach the bench, Your Honor? See, we couldn't get to the bench of the Father. But Jesus Christ, in His death, gave us the privilege of approaching the Father, the person of highest rank in the universe. And we can add to that by confessing, by doing good deeds, by keeping the Mosaic Law, by being baptized. We can add and gain not only peace with God, but the privilege of approaching God through adding to the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. You see, when you unfold it more and more and you see what Jesus' death offers the unbeliever, it just becomes more and more ridiculous that you could add to the finished work of Jesus Christ in order to gain peace with God and the privilege to approach God the Father Himself. So Jesus not only died in our place, taking our penalty on Himself by choice, but He also made it possible for us to approach God the Father. The privileges that we have as Christians to pray to, the, to, pray to God the Father, to worship God, to be in fellowship with God the Father, to have an intimate relationship with God the Father, the person of highest rank in the universe, all of those privileges were made possible by the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and in no other way. Through whom also, it says, through whom also, we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. Could there be any more of an unmerited, unearned grace gift than to be able to approach the Father? And He says, come, pray to me. Cast all your cares on me. I care for you. Not if you don't believe in Jesus. Not if you don't go through Jesus. I'm the way, the truth, the life. And no man comes unto the Father except through me. What do we get from Jesus? Access. Forgiven sins. Justification. The removal of the guilt. No more condemnation. And men somehow think they can add to this. It's astounding that men think they can add to it. One more, I think. We're freed from God's wrath. No, two more. We're freed from God's wrath. John 3.36, there are other places you could go. Romans 1.18 is another place you can write down. Stating that the wrath of God exists and the wrath of God is on the unbelieving soul. The justified, righteous wrath of God is against the sinner. We're freed from God's wrath. John 3.36, look what it says. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son by believing in Him. Remember John 3.16, all who believe 
shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's the command of Jesus in context. That what, that's what he says, believe in me, believe in the Son. So John in 3.36 says these words, He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not believe, you could say believe the Son, or obey the words of the Son to believe in Him, will not see life. You will remain an unbeliever if you don't believe in Jesus. And what does it say about the wrath of God? It abides on Him. Abides is a Greek word, meno. It means to continue, to remain so the wrath of God remains on the unbeliever who refuses to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. What do we get when Jesus Christ dies on the cross and we believe in Him? The removal of the God the Father's wrath against us. If you don't think God's wrath was against you as an unbeliever, read that verse again. He who does not obey the Son, and there was a time in all of our lives when we were in unbelief, and we were the recipients of the wrath of God. It was on us. John says, if you don't believe the Son and gain eternal life through the Son, then the wrath of God continues to be on you. So it's real And what do we get from Jesus? We're freed from from the Father's wrath. No longer are we in a wrathful relationship with God, but what do we have? Peace. I mean, goodness, how could could anybody... Listen, you know the other thing, not only adding to salvation, which which the religious world wants to do, but how in the world could you present this Savior to an unbeliever and they not say with open arms, I'll take it. Who is this God that loves me this much? Who is this Jesus who sacrificed so much for me and gave me so much? All I have to do is believe? Oh my word, I'll take it. I'll take it right now. The word says, nope. The world says, no. No, we don't believe that. The bulk of the world says, no, we don't believe that. can't be true. There's no God. There's no sin. There's no Adam. There's no, uh, there's no none of that. We, what, who, what God do I owe anything to? Such a loving God made things so simple for man. And man says no. And what else do we get from Jesus' death? This is the last one. The possession of eternal life. Not eternal death in the lake of fire. We've been freed from the guilt. The guilt's been lifted. The condemnation's been lifted. Our sins have been forgiven. We have a righteousness of Jesus Christ. We're freed from God's wrath. We're at peace with God the Father now. All we need is eternal life to get into heaven. And thank goodness the Bible says that's exactly what we get. Eternal life from believing in Jesus Christ. Look what it says, a couple of verses. Romans chapter 5, verse 17 and 18. Now, if you don't know Romans 5, verse 12 and following, you need to get into that Scripture. You need to get into that Scripture. It's probably the greatest place in the New Testament dealing with salvation and why a man needs to be saved and how a man is saved. By one man, it, con- it contrasts the whole way what Adam did to you, what Jesus does for you. What Adam did to you, what Jesus does for you. What Adam does it like six times in a row. Through one man's sin, through one man's iniquity, through one man's transgression, this happened to you, and this happened to you, and this happened to you. But thank God the rest of the verse is in there. But through the one man, Jesus, the last Adam, all these things are lifted. This is one of those contrasting what we got from Adam and what we get in belief from Je- after belief in Jesus Christ. So the one that does the bad here is Adam. For if by the transgression of the one, that's Adam, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in the life through the one Jesus Christ. What do we get from Adam's sin? Death reigning. Death. What do we get from Jesus? An abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. I'll take it. Who who doesn't say I'll take it? All I have to do is believe that? 
I mean, imagine me as a Catholic coming into an understanding of that. I'm no fool. I'll take it. I lived as a fool for 20 years. Being deceived as, as Satan veiled my eyes to the truth of the gospel. But once I understood it, an abundance of grace, a gift of righteousness, I'll take it. I'll take that right now. So then as through the one transgression, Adam's transgression, Adam's sin, there resulted condemnation to all men. If somebody ever says to you, well, I don't think that all, but just because Adam sinned, why, do all, why are all men, where do you get that from, that all humans are condemned? I get it from right there. Romans chapter 5, verse 18. Can't be any clearer. Through one transgression of Adam, there resulted condemnation to all men. Pas is the Greek word all, A-L-L-P-A-S is the Greek word. All means all, and that's all all means. Sin was inherited by all humans. And that's bad news, but what's the good news on the end of it? Even so... Even that one sin of Adam that condemned all of the human race thanked the Father for sending the Son because even so through one act of righteousness, and who did that act? Not you. Not by works of righteousness which we have done. Not by works of righteousness which we have done. This act of righteousness is not anything a man does. This is the act of righteousness that Jesus Christ performed. Adam sinned, killed us all. Jesus sacrificed Himself for us, made us all alive together with Him. How could you say no to this, man? Even so, through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. All you have to do is believe it. It's all right there. And the last verse tonight... In Romans 5, just a few verses later, so that as sin reigned in death, we're talking about eternal life now, through the cross of Jesus Christ, that one act of righteousness. As sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. How can you add to that? How can you be a part of of making yourself at peace with God, lifting the condemnation that you got right here. It says all were condemned through the act of Adam. How can you lift that? How can you make yourself justified and make the Father declare you righteous? How can you get your sins forgiven? How can you stand in God's grace? How can you free yourself from the wrath of God? And how can you gain eternal life? The Bible says there's only one way. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. It's astounding to me. I mean, it's, it's, it's puzzling. It's not puzzling like I don't get it. I understand the heart of man is deceitful above all things. And I also understand how desperately men want to be a part of their salvation. Want to do something to earn it. No, but just men are so stubborn and bullheaded about accepting a free gift. But I'll, I'll ask this question. Is anyone involved... Is anyone involved in the removal of sin's guilt other than Jesus Christ and God the Father? Is anyone else in the story of the Scripture? Is, does God invite anyone else into the lifting, the removal of, of mankind's sin guilt other than Himself as the Father and His Son as the payer of the penalty? Is anybody else added in that? Nobody. Nobody. Faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus of Nazareth. Over and over. 
over and over as Paul gives the gospel, as Jesus presents himself as the Savior, as Peter gives the gospel, over and over it's Jesus of Nazareth. It never says Rick King. All it says about me is believe what he did and you'll be saved. And so one day I said, yeah, okay, I will. (laughs) You bet I will. That's exactly what I'm about to do. I believe, Father, that you sent Jesus to pay for my sins, that he bore a a penalty that I could never, ever pay. Took my sins away. He forgave me. The Father was able to forgive my sins. I was able to be at peace with God through what Jesus did. And I realized just how silly and inconsequential, listen to this, I realized how silly and inconsequential everything that I had believed that I had to do to please the Father, to lift His wrath from me, to lift the sin guilt that I was under, to make me at peace with Him, to give me eternal life, to declare me righteous, I realized one day how silly and inconsequential all that Catholic garbage was. And I believe that Jesus was my Savior. Not me. He. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for...